Well, good evening. You know, back in the 50s, the United States deployed batteries of anti-aircraft missiles around her major cities and military installations. Shortly after their deployment, though, some foreign policy strategists argued for decommissioning these weapons on the grounds that such a reliable anti-aircraft interceptor would ultimately lead to the Soviet Union developing intercontinental ballistic missiles of their own. These missiles approach too quickly and at too high an angle for anti-aircraft weapons to intercept. So, America changed her policy to rely instead on MAD, that's Mutually Assured Destruction. The military dubbed these missiles the Nike after the Greek goddess of victory. Years later, another Nike arrived on the scene, the Nike that you're probably more familiar with. Not missiles, not a pagan goddess, but the shoes you wear on your feet. And while the sneaker bears the name of the goddess of victory, I can assure you that merely wearing them will not guarantee such. I'm living proof of that. I've had many pairs of Nike shoes in my lifetime, but I've yet to win a race or a contest as a result. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. My favorite chapter in all of Scripture, Romans chapter 8. Let's begin reading in verse 31. Paul writes these words. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He also did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not then also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My first year as a coach, I was an assistant at Paragould High School, my alma mater. I was fortunate enough to be able to learn from the winningest coach in the state of Arkansas, Dr. Robert Painter. And we had a really good team that year. Our starting five stood 5'8", 6'2", 6'3", 6'5", and 7' foot. And because we had a really tall kid who was a pretty highly recruited athlete, and because we were pretty good as a team, we played a tough schedule. One of the teams that everyone thought would not be tough would be uh, Crowley's Ridge Academy, which was the Church of Christ school in town where my wife attended and her brothers attended as well. We played CRA every year and we beat them every year. They were a little single A school while Paragould High was 5A. And in the 16 years of playing Crowley's Ridge Academy, they had never beaten us. And we had already played them once at our place and we assumed that we would beat them again at their place. They had one really good player his name was Cheney Rogers. He was six foot five, left-handed, a do-it-all kind of player who was very difficult to stop. He was also my wife's brother. So that made it even more interesting. Coach Painter knew that I was close to the situation, obviously, and so he asked me, he said, who would you use to guard Cheney? And I told him Jeremy Heath. Jeremy was our best defender. He was tough, he was gritty, he didn't have to stop Cheney completely if he could just kind of throw him off his game or slow him down. And so we did what we had to do. We knew that CRA was a team that went as Cheney went. He was their best option. We had to contain him to win. It was really pretty simple, and so we put Jeremy Heath on him. But Libby's brother didn't really cooperate with our strategy. By the end of the night, Cheney had 35 points, five dunks, and put on an absolute show in front of his home crowd. And for the first time in 16 years, Paragould lost to little old CRA. It was David versus Goliath. It was an underdog story. And you know what? So are we. As Christians, we face seemingly insurmountable odds. It's us against the world. And the world has greater resources and greater manpower. We are vastly outnumbered. And the devil has the world at his disposal. He asserts great power in the world. He exercises great strength. He has and continues to have great success claiming the souls of many victims. 
He is a formidable foe for sure. And so, since Satan's influence is so readily seen in our world today, taunting us, tempting us, pulling out all the stops to entice us into sin, we've got to have a strategy, right? And we are considered the biggest underdogs in history, with no shot of even competing, much less winning. And yet, we can pull off the biggest upset in history because the battle is not ours. We are not left to fight this fight alone. We are not defenseless against Satan and the forces of evil. In fact, it's not even a fair fight. Thankfully, God loves the underdog. And time after time, we see in Scripture that he chose people who were not your prototypical Hollywood hero. People like Gideon, David, and others. God's selection process shows us a few things. It shows us that he sees all people as having potential. It shows us that even the weakest person can be strong when they trust in God. And it shows us that God can be victorious over any and every situation, even in the face of insurmountable odds. The truth is, neither Gideon or David or any of God's heroes were ever at a disadvantage in the first place. In fact, it wasn't even a fair fight. The battle was over before it ever began. Victory was already assured. The enemy had already been conquered. We learn from guys like Gideon and David that dependence on God is what brings the victory. We're engaged in a battle every single day. And some days we feel defeated. Some days we are weak. Some days we feel inadequate. And some days the enemy seems insurmountable. But we can look to God's heroes like Gideon and David as our guide. The power of God is something that we should depend on and something that we should place our trust in each and every day. Paul makes this clear in the passage we read a moment ago, Romans chapter 8. With Christ, victory is a guarantee. We cannot lose. In fact, we've already won. Though we face seemingly insurmountable odds, though it seems as though we have no shot at victory, though we are undermanned and undersized, and though we lack the strength and the resources, we are victors because God is the great equalizer. He is in control. The battle belongs to him. And we can place our full faith and trust in him, knowing that victory is assured. We can have that blessed assurance that no matter what hardship we may encounter, we have deliverance. The thrust of Paul's message in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 38, is one of encouragement to remain steadfast in the midst of trials and tribulations. Persecution was a common fate for Christians living in this day and time, and Paul knew all about bearing the brand marks of a true follower. He points to the blessings that come from being in Christ, blessings such as hope, assurance, future glory, blessings that can be enjoyed even in the midst of hardship and strife. And while Paul's words to the Roman brethren center on the Christian's steadfastness in persecution, we all know that there are other first century Christians that had to endure so many things for their faith, faced hardship that put their faith to the test, much like some people have to face today. Maybe we're not in that boat, but there are those Christians in other places in our world who are facing deep persecution, who are experiencing mocking and ridicule for their faith, we all know about experiencing defeat. In this great battle against the devil and the spiritual forces of evil, we will be knocked down. We will be wounded. We may not face the things that Paul faced, but a Christian's victory is assured. Even in the midst of trials and hardship, there will still be defeat. However, we understand that defeat can be a path to victory. I want you to take Joshua, for example. Joshua was, of course, Moses' successor, the one chosen to conquer and take possession of the promised land. Three times, the Lord exhorted Joshua to be strong and courageous. Victory was guaranteed for Joshua and the Israelites because God was on their side. And after the conquest of Jericho, everything seemed to be going according to plan. Next on the list was Ai. And after spying out the land, Joshua decided to only send about two or 3,000 men to siege Ai. I mean, after all, there's no need to waste you know, too much energy or too many men. Victory was assured, right? Ai should be no problem for the Israelites. But Joshua's confidence took a huge hit as 36 of the Israelite men were struck down and the rest were run out of town. The hearts of the people melted and became like water, it says in Joshua 7 verse 5. How could this have happened? God was supposed to be on their side, watching over them, guiding them, assuring them victory. But it happened because there was sin in the camp. Israel acted unfaithfully. One man, 
One man by the name of Achan had sinned and it cost the entire group. That sin had to be removed. Achan and his family were stoned to death. The sin was removed from the camp and the Israelites could now move forward. So God tells Joshua, do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. God promised Joshua victory. In fact, he even says, you've already won if you just follow my instructions. And Joshua, of course, conquers Ai, but not before he learned a valuable lesson through defeat. Think about the different defeats in your life. What are they? What were they? What are some of the things that knocked you down? What are some of the trials and tribulations that you've had to face or maybe that you're facing right now? For some of us, it may have been the loss of a job. For others, it may have been the loss of a loved one. It may have been a devastating diagnosis. Perhaps it was a divorce. Maybe it was an addiction. I mean, whatever it was, most if not all of us can point to a time in our lives when we have felt defeated, a time when perhaps we felt that we couldn't go on. But how many of us can reflect upon those defeats now and see that they made us much stronger? How many of us can, can see that these defeats, while traumatic at the time, were ultimately for our own good? Even death is a path to victory. The world sees death as defeat, but for the Christian, it is a victory. Now, death is the enemy, of course. And yes, the death seems like it's winning on this side of eternity, but it's not the worst possible fate for a Christian. The Christian sees death as an opportunity to be resurrected in the end, to go home. You know, with time comes perspective. Can we not see that the difficulties we have faced were beneficial to our faith, our character, and our spiritual th strength? And it is through defeat that our faith is refined. It is through defeat that our faith is strengthened. And it is through defeat that we learn to rely even more heavily on God. It's through defeat that we come to know and understand that our life is about something bigger and better. That doesn't mean that defeat is, is, is something that's good or something that we enjoy or even something that we would wish or pray for, but it can be a path to victory. The question we must ask ourselves is, am I a survivor or am I a conqueror? The answer is probably both much of the time, you know, but I think there are far too many who are trying to wait it out. They're just trying to survive and get by and weather the storm until it passes. And sometimes that's a good strategy, but a survivor is defined as one who continues to function or prosper in spite of opposition, hardship, or setbacks. And that's all well and good. Certainly, there is some nobility in being a survivor. But you don't want to make, you don't want to make surviving the only goal. We are more than survivors. Paul says that we are conquerors, and we're even more than conquerors, he says. A conqueror is one who conquers or vanquishes. It's synonymous with victor. Notice again Paul's words in Romans 8, 37. He says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. The New King James, if you use that version, reads, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That phrase, more than conquerors, is, is just one word in the Greek language. It's the word hypernikeo, and, and the root is Nike or nikos, which refers to victory. Hypernikaio literally means to gain a surpassing victory, to have complete triumph, to win a most thorough victory. And that certainly intonates more than simply surviving or getting by. A conqueror doesn't just wait it out. A conqueror overcomes. A conqueror rises victorious. But notice again that Paul doesn't just say that we are conquerors. He says that we are more than conquerors. You know, I, I don't know about you, but that phrase intrigues me. I mean, what does he mean that we are more than conquerors? How can one be more than a conqueror? Isn't a conqueror the highest standard? I mean, if you win, you win, right? What's greater than being an overcomer or a victor? Well, anytime one engages in battle, there are losses that are incurred. Even though one may win the war, they will inevitably lose something in the process, right? Soldiers lose their lives. Innocent women and children die at the hands of the enemy. In the midst of intense fighting, some are wounded and disfigured. Others live the rest of their lives with the pain and the scars of warfare. Victory comes at a big price. And being a conqueror is many times a bittersweet affair. But what do we lose as a Christian? 
What do suffering saints lose in the end? We may lose earthly things, earthly possessions, but is that really a loss? Certainly there is a sacrifice that comes with following Christ. There is a dying to self, but is that really a loss? Not when compared to what we have to gain. And what we gain is far greater than any earthly victory. The spoils are exceedingly rich, glory, honor, peace, a crown of righteousness that fades not away. Many conquests are dearly bought. But what do conquering saints lose? We are more than conquerors because we lose little, but we gain much. We are super conquerors. So here's the question I'll leave you with tonight. What shall we say to these things? Same question Paul asked. What shall we say to these things? What shall we, the people of God, say to these things? Already, as your new week begins, you are more than a conqueror. So go live like it. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And God, even though it's not what we would want even though we'd rather be together in person, hugging one another, seeing one another's faces, being encouraged by one another's presence, we thank you for the opportunity that we have through the online uh, uh, venue. But God, we do pray that this COVID, COVID chaos will be over soon. We pray for our frontline workers. We pray for our healthcare workers. We pray for, for all those who are doing their dead level best to, to deal with this virus. And of course, God, we pray for all of those who are affected by it directly and indirectly. We have so many at our church that are dealing with it and the effects of it, and we pray earnestly for them. God, we pray for us as well, that each of us individually as the church can go out and live as conquerors. Help us, God, to win the day each and every day. It's in your son's precious name we pray, amen. I love you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.